All right, everyone. Like Chris was saying, uh, I'll just get kicked off now. Uh, presentations about using a quote unquote robot to help solve our issues with uh, Kubernetes and apps that run inside of Kubernetes. So a little bit about me. Okay, I've been around for a little while, uh, a little over 20 years. I uh, worked with Chris in the past. Actually, he was uh, helped me kind of tangentially when I was building a, a company back in the past. Uh, worked in different fields in tech, done everything from building data centers to helping direct drivers, things like that. Uh, currently, I'm in the freelance market. I raise chickens and things like that. So uh, recently, I've been working in observability, and for some reason, that industry keeps pulling me back in. So uh, I'm, I'm also looking for uh, opportunities in AI now. Which is why I'm doing this because it was kind of a good segue into that. Uh, and as you can see, if you want to get a hold of me at any point in time, I'm very hard to find online. So uh, you know, just go ahead and reach out anytime. Give any questions or anything about the presentation. So in order to figure out what the point of all this is, we sort we have to figure out where we are, where where we are at currently. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about Kubernetes. You know why Kubernetes is important. Observability, why that's important with Kubernetes, why it's actually needed. It's not, it's not like a nice to have, it's an actual requirement. Uh, Prometheus, how that plays into the uh, observability ecosystem. Robusto, what that is, how it actually uses Kubernetes uh, and Prometheus to build up a, a set of observability metrics and observability uh, uh, data points that you can look at so you can find problems. And then kind of what people are actually waiting for is this open AI integration that the Robusta team has put together. Uh, and it's all, all this is open source. So you can actually go in and see it and add prompts to it and things like that. It's actually pretty interesting. And then hopefully be able to do a short demo of what it's actually doing. Uh, and hopefully a demo doesn't turn into demolition. So, uh, so currently Kubernetes, I'm sure everybody in here has at least touched Kubernetes at some point in time. So you, understand what the uh, advantage of using Kubernetes is, right? It's, you know, it's cloud native uh, container orchestration. You can build apps that are cloud native, they're scalable, they're portable. Uh, the biggest thing, especially for like the bean counters they like is that you can actually add a lot of cost efficiency in it. So you can get more out of less hardware, so, so to speak. So obviously all of this is good stuff. Right, I mean, everybody likes all this stuff. So what's actually the issue when it comes to Kubernetes? You know, this is the issue, right? If you, if you don't really know what you're looking at, this is what you get. Think about being one of these initiated and you sit down for like the first or second time and you're trying to figure out a problem or you're trying to write an app or you're trying to get a pod running and someone throws this in front of you, right? You don't know what's actually going on, right? There's a lot of complexity, uh, which is, just inherent with flexibility. So if something's flexible, it can be complex. And because of that complexity, this is where observability comes in. Uh, in order to actually have these complex systems, in order to actually use them, in order to be able to get the most out of them, you have to actually know what's happening inside of that system, right? So this is where observability comes in. And in the past, there's been these one-off flavors of observability out there. You had things like certain companies, you know, I'm not going to speak illy of anybody, but you have companies out there that have their own kind of native observability uh, platforms that use their own types of metrics, that have their own query languages, that had all of these different things, and it was a very fractured ecosystem. Uh, but at the same time, it was needed, right? So people would go out there and get an observability platform, say like Data dog or SysDig, they have deployed that into their environment so they can actually see what was happening inside of their uh, Kubernetes environment. Uh, well, that's all good. Those platforms are fine. There's nothing wrong with those platforms. But now, this is where Prometheus is coming in. Okay, people want to have a cloud native, an actual cloud native observability platform that uh, that works across, you know, AWS, Google. OpenStack, whatever have you, wherever you're deploying Kubernetes, they want to be able to use a cloud native uh, observability platform. And that, that's where Prometheus comes in. If you look at any of the companies out there, such as, uh, say, Sysdig or Datadog or Chronosphere or Grafana, any of them, they're all using under the hood. It's some, in some way, shape, or form, they're either compatible with or using Prometheus. Okay. Uh, and 
why would you want to use Prometheus? Well, for all the things I just said, plus, you know, out of the box, it just works with Kubernetes. Okay, you deploy Kubernetes, you deploy Prometheus, you're up and running in very short order. Uh, you can write all of your applications that run inside of Kubernetes to have scrape endpoints. So if you're using something like Python or Golang, they have libraries that are just native to Prometheus, so you can build your own scrape endpoints and gather metrics from the, the application itself to put it in Prometheus, to scrape into Prometheus. So you'll have your application layer, your Kubernetes layer, and then you'll also have, say, your virtual infrastructure, maybe even your physical infrastructure, all having metrics inside of Prometheus. And that's very powerful because when there's an issue, you can go in and actually model the data and find out where where things are, like where's network issues, where's bottlenecks, why the pod family, you know, things like that, all the things you do during a troubleshooting uh, session if something broke. Uh, and also with Prometheus, you get the added advantage of having this very flexible query language just built into it called PromQL. Okay. Uh, the double edged sort of the flexibility again of PromQL is very high learning curve. Okay. I mean, if you sat down PromQL, yeah, you can look at a couple of docs and you can start doing some simple queries like summing and ranging and things like that. I mean, you get into much more complex uh, data queries and data modeling, the complexity of the queries goes like that. Okay, it's, it's, it's very complex. I'm by no means an expert in it. Okay, I have to constantly ask people for help. So to, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, that in Prometheus, it also simplified the data gathering, the metrics gathering process. So in the past, in some platforms, they actually had to push data to the actual platform, right? Well, you can see how that can become a problem is you just try to scale up, okay, the number of and the number of nodes will say they're pushing uh, metrics to these platforms. But Prometheus, you get something very interesting. Instead of actually pulling data or pushing data to Prometheus, you're pulling data through the scrape method. So they have a thousand endpoints out there that you need to scrape. You configure Prometheus to go out and just scrape all those endpoints to pull the data in. Okay, so you're not actually overloading the Prometheus system, you're just going out scraping all those different endpoints. Um, so, Prometheus, while well, it's awesome, it's cool, I love Prometheus. There's two issues with it. There's no login, there's no tracing it. Those are separate platforms, and it's worth mentioning. I know it's outside of the scope of this, but it is worth mentioning. Okay, so now that we know Kubernetes and Prometheus, they're really cool, but they're complex, and they're kind of a pain if you don't know what you're looking at and what you're doing. This is where this project called Robusta comes. This is something I was explaining to Chris earlier that I found uh, because I've been doing a little bit of research into uh, AI, how to make uh, observability a little bit easier to look at, how to simplify Kubernetes troubleshooting. And I found this, and I thought, hey, this is actually really cool stuff. It seems like they're really putting a lot of work into this. So it's open source, obviously. Um, it does have a component, a SaaS component that we'll get to later that is not, to my knowledge, that I can really open source project, but you know, say if you have under 20 nodes, you can still use it for free. Uh, what's really nice about Robust does it takes these two complex systems and it simplifies them. It actually is for, for all intents and purposes, a simplified observability and automation platform for Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, while you strictly don't need Prometheus to run Robusta, it's highly suggested that it, that you have it in place. And if you don't have Prometheus already in place, when you deploy Robusta into your Kubernetes uh, environment, it'll actually set up Prometheus for you. So uh, when you go through and you actually set up the uh, the configuration YAML manifest, you can specify, yes, go ahead and deploy Prometheus for me, and it'll just go ahead and do it. So it makes it, it's very easy to deploy. It's, um, and at the end, I actually have the, uh, the Git repository that I use. I loaded all my notes and everything into that repository. So if you guys want to go home and just uh, pull that down and play around with it, you know, obviously feel free to. What's going on under the hood of Robusta? And this is a very high level uh, diagram that I pulled from their, uh, from their website. They have the forwarder, which is actually, that monitors Kubernetes uh, and Prometheus. Uh, well, Prometheus. They have a little bit more on here, but we're just talking about Kubernetes and Prometheus. So it's actually going to uh, look at Kubernetes and Prometheus see what's going on and any kind of alerting or any kind of, uh, uh, we'll say, anything you're really looking for to happen in that environment will be 
forwarded onto the runner, and the runner is where a lot of the magic kind of takes place. That's where, uh, you know, these things that Robusta calls playbooks, which are automations that you can use to automate your environment or even uh, remediate issues, like simple issues that come up inside the environment. You can use a playbook to do it. Uh, and there's a bunch of playbooks already built into Robusta. This thing kind of works out of the box already when you deploy it. But you can pretty simply write these playbooks yourself, okay, and then uh, deploy them into the runner. As a matter of fact, this OpenAI uh, API extension is a quote-unquote playbook that just uh, gets deployed into the runner uh, at, at, uh, at uh, install time. So, uh, and then obviously the OpenAI plugin, it just extends uh, the runner to be able to talk to the OpenAI uh, API uh, and prompt it to, to bring back information. Any questions so far? So you're going to share with us some of the work you've done, like the GitHub link? Yeah, the GitHub link's at the end. So I mean, people can just go ahead and clone it and play around with, uh, play around with it and walk through what I'm talking about right now. Sure. Thanks. So how do you interact with Robusta? There's a couple of different ways. There's this thing called the Robusta CLI, which is you can just install it with PIP. If you go to the uh, Robusta uh, GitHub uh, repository or their website, but they have very, very simple instructions to go ahead and install that. And once you get that installed, that's where you actually put the, uh, uh, where you actually create this uh, Kubernetes manifest, this manifest that you're, that you're going to use. Well, it's actually not a Kubernetes manifest. It's a the manifest you're going to use with Helm because uh, you, you actually use Helm to install. So that's what makes it so easy. Uh, but you can actually go through, if you wanted to, go ahead and pull down the uh, the code for Robusta that runs inside of your Kubernetes environment, modify it, build it, write your own manifest, do whatever you want with it. I use Helm because it's the easiest way to do it. Um, so, yeah, you'll use that CLI to, to, to make that value dynamo file. Uh, and it's not, I mean, you can't really administer Robusta with the CLI, but from what, I, what I've seen with my limited exposure to it, it's very good at obviously building that configuration file and looking at log files. Okay, that's what I've been using it for. Uh, you also have a Grafana-based uh, local GUI. Uh, so uh, you will uh, obviously pipe this out through your Kubernetes environment. I'm not going, I'm not going to go into how to do that because I don't know how everybody has their environment set up. But uh, you can pipe that out and actually get to it. So you don't, you don't technically need to use the SAS GUI. Uh, so if you wanted to just have Robusta up and running, looking at your Kubernetes and Prometheus uh, uh, environments, or if you want to deploy Prometheus with Robusta, and actually just look at the metrics that are flowing in from both Kubernetes and Prometheus, you can use these Grafana dashboards. And now that there are a bunch of dashboards, there's also a lot of really good alerting uh, they've, they've already pre-built for you. Uh, like I said, it's, it's pretty much ready to go out of the box. So if you had an environment set up, you could just deploy this and feel pretty comfortable that you're going to cover, that you're going to get a lot of a uh, pace that you're kind of commonly see. But at the same time, it's very easily to easy to extend it using you know these uh, playbooks, these run books, and uh, also be able to write your own alerts for the alert manager and Prometheus as well as your own dashboards and Grafana if you wanted to. And then last but not least, the SAS GUI. That's that GUI enabled a lot of different stuff. Okay, it, it um, it's obviously easier to look at than some of the the, the uh, dashboards, and those are pretty easy to look at. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a second. I deploy the uh, demo, but it makes things easier to look at. You can drill down. You can very clearly see and track problems. It has a nice timeline, so you can see when problems are firing and how they relate to each other and things like that. So uh, the SAS GUI is very cool. And this is the actual part of the presentation. Now that we know where we're at, now we can actually look at what we're here for. So the open AI integration, like I said, it's a run book that actually runs inside of Robusta Runner. When you deploy Robusta on its own, it doesn't actually have this. You have to add it. And inside, if you look at my GitHub repo, as well as the Robusta docs on, in their GitHub repo and on their website, they don't, they don't explain how to actually enable this. It's really super easy, okay, to, to do. It's, I can paste a couple of lines of uh, code into your uh, values file and you deploy it with Helm and you're up and running or you can just do a Helm upgrade if you already have it deployed and it's working. Um, so this allows you to have that that open AI, that LLM integration. Uh, so you have chat GPT being assistant. Uh, this will forward the uh, alerts that come in to open AI. It'll query it with the prompting that's available inside of inside of the integration that you have. And what's neat about it, like I said, you can actually modify these prompts. And uh, I modify the prompts a little bit because I think that you get a little better results with the prompt that I have. 
Um, I don't think it was actually really good. It's just, I, I wasn't actually giving back commands. It was just giving back instructions of, oh, you're seeing this. Well, you know, maybe this is the problem. I actually wanted to be able to have uh, Kubernetes commands as well return back to me. So, you know, kind of the use case of I'm a level one support guy. This will actually just help me get pushed in the right direction, right? Uh, and uh, what's cool about it is Recruit has all these integrations. So you can, you know, either forward all this to like Slack, uh, Discord, Telegram, there's a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of different integrations. So that if you're, you know, just out living your life, you can interact with this thing and uh, uh, actually get some work done or remediate an issue if it's a simple issue or troubleshooting an issue with somebody on the phone, right? Uh, there's a couple of things that you're gonna need to make it work. Slack channel, for this instance, it's a Slack channel, but like I said, if you go to the website, you can look at all the different integrations that they have. For this, uh, this demo Slack channel, which I'm sure everybody has the, one of those in some way, shape, or form, and then open API key, which don't draw back to that, is that there's a nominal charge to use the API. Uh, I mean, I guess if you're making hundreds of thousands of calls, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But for this, I was telling Chris, I think I've spent five bucks in the last few months playing around with this, so it's a nominal fee. Uh, and right here at the bottom, you can see there's the, the actual GitHub repo, so you can go take a look at the actual code. Yep. Fine. Uh, have you looked at what data is being sent to OpenAI? So, like from a security context, is OpenAI using the data you're sending it and mapping your topology of, your, for instance, your Kubernetes cluster That's and learning question. from it? That's a good question. Uh, yeah. So, what's happening is you're sending, and I can actually show you this. Let me. Uh, here, I didn't mean to derail you. No, you didn't derail me at all. Let me, let me talk about. I'll actually show you the the repository. So you can see the prompt. Uh, you, what it's really doing is, I'll explain it real quick, is the integration is, it's you know, like you go to ChatGPT and you type in uh, the prompt, say, hey, I want to know what a blue jay is or whatever, you know, yeah. and it gives back a bunch of information. That's really what it's doing in the background. It's not, it's not technically scanning your network and pulling that data in. Uh, it only knows what the prompt is that's getting sent, okay? And I'll try to talk about it. It's probably what we do if I actually show you the prompt, because it's a, it's a natural language processor, right? So you just type a sentence in, which is technically all you're saying is a sentence saying, hey, I need it in this format, blah, 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 and here's my issue, okay? Yeah. So, um, no, that's a, that's a very good question. That, that is a concern. Uh, uh, you don't get, obviously, you don't want to have, for security reasons, have that data just dumped out onto right. the, the world to see, right? Exactly. Uh, but right here, you can see it with the Slack integration. Uh, when, when an issue happens and it says, Hey, this issue happened and shoot you a message. There's a couple different things you can do. You can either click on the investigate button, go right to the SAS uh, uh, interface uh, for Robusta and start drilling down and troubleshooting like you normally would. Okay. You can silence it. So it's just something that's like an annoyance, like, yeah, I know that pod's going to crash. Okay, fine, whatever. They can wait till tomorrow. You can just silence it for however long you want to silence it for. Again, that takes you into the SAS, uh, SAS environment. You can configure the, uh, the, uh, um, the silencing. But then there's this new button. We have this plugin for uh, Chat GPT for all the purposes installed in the runner. It's going to forward you this button as well. Say, hey, let's ask Chat GPT what it thinks. So you push that button, you give it a couple seconds to process, and then it will shoot back an answer to you. It's actually, like I was Chris, right now it's, it's, it's good. I mean, it'll push you in the right direction. It's not a be all and end all yet, but if you give this thing like another 18 months of development, and you're actually able to train the the, uh, the LLM a little bit more on some issues that you're seeing in Kubernetes, I'm I'm pretty confident that it's going to give a heck of a lot better answers. And actually, at some point, you're just going to say, yeah, just go ahead and remediate that, and it'll just end up doing it for you. Just follow all, all your own directions, right? Just go through and automate that right out. I mean, with, with Robusta, you can already, like I said, remediate some of these simpler issues already with the runbook. So if an issue pops up, like this pod, is, it'll crash if a load goes above, okay, well, scale form or something like that, right? Um, you can already do stuff like that. So if you think about it, if you're getting this data back, somehow integrate it back in with a run book that will then, okay, this might be an issue. Well, I'm gonna remediate it with this automation. Okay, now let's see what happens. Maybe that could be our level one support, right? Uh, if that doesn't work, okay, now I need to get on, now I need to put hands on the keyboard, figure out what's going on, right? Question. Yeah. 
Do you know if there's a company behind the robust the robusta, or is there is it just like a bunch of uh, you know nerds uh, came up with the idea? Yeah, that's that's good. Good. No, that's a, that's a good question too. And there's a small company behind it. Uh, they they have a website. They have a corporate website. Um, like I said, it's, it's free to use. The SaaS environment, twenty nodes. But after that, and they they do have a uh, licensing for uh, anything over twenty nodes or businesses. Uh, they also have like an unlimited kind of all you can eat type of plan on there. So there there is a company behind it. It's a, it's a startup, or at least it looks like it's a startup. It's a pretty good idea. I like it. Um, I think that if they they play their cards right and they uh, they start honing in on something like this, I think they're going to be in pretty good shape. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's see how it works. And right there, the the uh, that's, that's the uh, GitHub repo that I used to put this all together. So if you want to go ahead and pull it uh, down, you can play with this as well. Um, just to be hundred percent transparent, I actually I copied how did I copy their code down? I changed the prompt, I put it in this repository. I think I'm actually gonna fork their repository. I put the changes I made in there and submit a PR uh, just feel like I was comparing the results. And I, 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 I think I'm getting the better results than what they were getting out. So I want to see what they think too. Uh, but okay, so this is demo time. Demo time. Hopefully, I hope it doesn't turn into demolition time. But okay, so let's go ahead and deploy it. I'm just running from my laptop. I'm in mini, mini queue right now. Give them in to come up. I should have done this beforehand, but it is what it is. <laughs> I got these are all like very kindergarten level shell scripts. They were honestly just because I can't type. Okay. And I'd be able to type, I'd be spending more time trying to type than uh, demoing. So I figured out how to do that. So if you bring it in, uh, if you clone the repository, you can just go ahead and use these same things and it'll just do the same thing on your laptop. All right. Okay. All right. Let's just grow up and run. So, as you can see, right here, I'm deploying Prometheus with Reboost. I'm not going to go through and actually generate the uh, uh, the uh, Helm values file. It's the simple fact that it's it's really straightforward. I mean, when you look at the doc, it's literally one line. Put it in, done. It just spits all the stuff out. Copy and paste the uh, the Open AI integration stuff into it, and you're done. I mean, it'll take you a few minutes to actually do it. Uh, that's kind of a note. If you uh, pull this repository down, you're going to have to do that part because I was going to put the generated uh, the values file in there because they have a bunch of security keys in there, and I don't want to obviously for obvious reasons I don't want to go into my environment. Uh, so as you can see, it's, it's deployed, uh, you know, Prometheus, the forwarder, Grafana for those those uh, local dashboards, um, as well as the cube state metrics is running. Uh, Prometheus node export, so I can actually scrape my physical node or physical node, however you define that. It could be a virtual node too, obviously. And then a runner. So everything's up and running. Um, and if we go over here, refresh this. Go in here, and we can see that's the alerting. So if you look at the alerting rules, like I said, Robusta comes with a bunch of predefined rules. Okay, right out of the box. Okay, um, really good rules. Like I said, this thing if you were to deploy this in your environment, say you have like a home lab set up, or you're just testing something out, or you had a dev, dev environment up, you can feel pretty confident that this will catch almost everything that you're going to 
feet in general. So if you go back here to home and uh, say we want to look at the dashboards, probably not going to be a lot of data in there because it just came up. But there's a lot of really good dashboards in here. Let me go back over here. So we can actually go in here and as you can see, there's a lot of really good uh, predefined dashboards. You, know, you can look at things like Cubelet that's running, uh, the alert manager overview. So there's really no alerts running right now because nothing's broken yet. So we're not going to see anything happening. But you know that it's there. It'll, it'll also uh, tell you when messages are sent out like Slack or Discord or Telegram and things like that. And what's nice about it is that it is for fun. If you wanted to, you can go in there and either change those dashboards to fit your needs or, um, or to create new ones if you wanted to, which is what I would honestly do. So create new ones. Now, the SAP environment. Refresh this. Okay, so this is a SAP environment that uh, um, it's River Boost up and the, the free version of it, obviously. Uh, and when you do that generated values, it actually has all the connection information to connect you up to this. So it does it does everything. You don't you don't have to set up an account or anything. You just go in and fire it off, and you're good to go. You're ready to go. Uh, probably, like I said, you know, there's things like a timeline, so you can see what errors are happening or what's happening in your environment, what times they happen, it's a little bit simpler to see than, you know, go ahead and try to build out a, a, a dashboard inside of Grafana with a PromQL or how are you trying to get, get to the data, model the data. Uh, you can see what jobs have been running inside of uh, inside of the Kubernetes environment, and you can start drilling down inside of them. I mean, unfortunately, there's not going to be a lot of stuff to look at because this just came out it's only a dev environment, but you can get an idea of what you're actually looking at. So. You can see stuff. I can go and I can actually see the YAML that was used to deploy that job. Uh, I can see CPU and memory utilization, uh, alerts that are firing for it. Uh, you can see a whole bunch of different stuff inside of inside of this um, uh, SAS environment. And what I really like about the SAS environment is it allows you to start drilling down. I like that ability to actually see like, a good overview and then to drill down inside of an environment. It, it, if you get too much data on the screen at one time, it gets very confusing. And honestly, it, it just you just get lost in it, right? It's like, oh, I don't know what I'm even looking at here. Um, obviously, this is a mini cube, so I only have one node. Say you had 50 nodes running in here, you can go in, you can see all your nodes, you can drill down on those. You can see what's going on inside of your nodes here, what's running on them, uh, the CPU utilization, the memory utilization for that node, uh, any alerts that are related to that node, um, events on that node. You can see a whole bunch of different data on there. And again, you can drill down into all of these different things. Uh, comparing clusters, I don't have obviously multiple clusters running, so I can't compare them to find out which one's running better and which one's not. So I can't do that. Uh, but, I'll just, but this is your actual cluster that, you, that I'm currently running right here called Prombot. Uh, so you can actually go and you can drill down and you can actually see different stuff inside of there. So, any questions so far before I actually hit the uh, the OpenAI demo? So you mentioned that it works with Prometheus. Does yeah. it? Does it also? Is there like a plugin for like Loki for logs at, at all, or does, is it just like strictly Prometheus? It's strictly Prometheus that I know of right now. Okay. Um, I would, that'd be really cool if they were using Loki. If they would have a Loki plugin, like to see all that. You know, you'd be able to relate your metrics to Kubernetes to logging. That'd be really cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, all right. We're gonna do is we're gonna actually deploy a, a broken pod. So let's go ahead and say play the demo. Okay, it's broken. See if the SAS environment caught it. Okay. On a timeline here, it's caught something here. Somebody hasn't fired off the alert yet. Oh, there it is. Okay, pod crashing. Here we go. So you can see that you got a pod crashing. 
like I said, if you want to, we can go in and actually investigate this. You can pull this up and investigate, go in here and start actually drilling down into it yourself through here. You can actually silence the alert if you want to. So it's something that was just really a not wait, you know, uh, silence and not being bothered by it for a little while. Um, you can also go over here and you can configure a silence break from uh, Slack if you wanted to. And you can also say, hey, why is this happening? Give it a second. Come back. This is actually, hopefully I have a little bit of time here. I might not want to put the limit. Um, there it is. So as you can see, this, this prompted the OpenAI API. The LLM looked at the issue that was sent to it and sent back a description of the problem, some kind of an example of it, what some of the possible causes that it thinks it might be. Okay. It's some simple troubleshooting steps that you can go through to help remediate this. Okay. And this is just a crashing pod. So obviously there's not a whole lot. You know, you look for the pod, do a describe, do a logs, find out what's going on, right? So it's gonna it's gonna um, just send back those steps. Um what would be really interesting is to see, like, oh, hey, I, I have a node down to see if they can actually start handling more and more complex issues. And I haven't actually been able to, to, to do that, but that would be something interesting to see if it would actually be able to handle those kind of issues and to be able to train the uh, model on the other end. So the more you think about it, the more data you send it, the more training it's going gonna, it's gonna to get. And it's going to be able to start giving back better answers over time. Um, and then I'll give you some possible solutions. This is what I was talking about, like, with that, that, that level one support guy sitting there he's like i don't know what i'm looking at here well this can actually help him figure out maybe push him in the right direction kind of give him that nudge to figure out what's actually broken and what's actually happening in that environment right uh so with that i know that the question was asked you know what data is actually being sent i'll just show you that very quickly here So if you go down here, this is the actual prompts that are being sent to, to the uh, OpenAI. Uh, so there's no environment data that's really going right. through. You're asking, you're more like, it'd be more like me asking Chris a question. Hey man, I'm hitting this problem. What can I do that, right? So yeah, no, it's, actually, it's, a, it's a good question to, to bring up. You don't want to have obviously your environment, your entire map of your environment getting sent out there without my dad. So I don't know if I'm actually a little bit over time. So any questions, any other questions? If not, obviously, like I said, I'm very hard to find online. So just go ahead and reach out to me and I'll help help you out with the meetup sometime. All right. Great. Great.